as we are here tonight, <coughs> to both remember and pay tribute to Alan Sussman, we are conscious of both time and place. We are conscious of time because 15 years ago to the day, we saw the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. <coughs> and we are conscious of place because Atlanta and Morehouse was the place that Martin Luther King used as his theater to preach a gospel to the world that reverberates even today. <coughs> and so, in the presence of these two Nobel Peace laureates, <coughs> we come here to give thanks to Morehouse College for keeping alive both the life and the message of a great South African, Alan Sussman. This confluence of time and place allows us to distill the lessons from her life and to view her life through the prism of both Yitzhak Rabin and Martin Luther King Jr. And to ponder, particularly from the contribution of Alan Sussman, to ponder the great conundrums and ironies that life poses to people like ourselves in general. The question we ask is, how does South Africa <coughs> produce a Helen Sussman, who was an ordinary Jewish woman growing up in the Transvaal, in a privileged con condition, but dedicated her life to the underprivileged? An ordinary white woman who did extraordinary things in the context of South Africa. And if we don't say it like that, we will not see the greatness. Because to be white and against apartheid was almost to be against yourself. To be Jewish and privileged and to say what she said was to speak even against other Jews and other privileged people who were timid in the face of an apartheid monster that was roaming South Africa. And if we don't understand that, we will not be able to unravel this conundrum and this irony that is contained in the life of Helen Sussman. And the vowed free marketeer, a capitalist by any other definition, who fought equally hard for the freedom of the communist leadership, who also found themselves in jail and in exile, who entered apartheid's evil bowels in parliament and used its privileges to attack apartheid. Those are the contradictions and the conundrums of life, who differed with the liberation movement about strategies, such as the use of sanctions economic sanctions as a way to bring apartheid down, but was at the same time at the service of that liberation movement <clears throat> where they needed to locate people who disappeared from society, where they needed to protect those who were in jail from the torture of apartheid. When she was able to force admissions from the ministers of police about whether someone was dead, missing, or in jail. She understood her own contradictions because she knew that she was being presented as a fig leaf to democracy in South Africa under apartheid. But simultaneously, she would be the one person casting, as Nelson Mandela called it, the lone vote against the 90-day detention law in South Africa. A law that says that without any proof, someone can be removed from society and placed in jail for 90 days, and then it can be renewed for another 90 days, etc., etc., until you could spend 10 years of 90-day portions. South Africa was this land when danger and death stalked you and it was capable of producing heroes and people of courage. It gave human beings the opportunity 
to transcend themselves by transcending their fears, by transcending sometimes their common sense judgments to enjoy the privileges, and by conquering the timidity that often comes in the face of an evil system. South Africa at that time had the capacity to make ordinary people extraordinary human beings. Nelson Mandela, in his last days in prison, when he was moved to Victor Vestair just before his release, wrote from Victor Vestair to Helen Sussman, and he said, and I quote, the consistency with which you defended the basic values of freedom and the rule of law has earned you the admiration of many South Africans. Nelson Mandela continues, a wide gap still exists between the mass democratic movement and your party with regard to the method of obtaining these values. But your commitment to a non-racial democracy and a united South Africa has won you many friends in the extra-parliamentary movement." Unquote. I raised that quote from Nelson Mandela because I think it summarizes a conversation that is often only possible in places like South Africa. It is not a conversation of those who choose to be confined by the inertia of conservative orthodoxy. Because had Nelson Mandela been a conservative orthodoxy, orthodox person, a conservative orthodox nationalist, he would not have been able to cross that divide to recognize the good in a Helen Sussman. It is this conversation that goes, that transcends our traditional conservative orthodoxies. Because often, these orthodoxies only confirms what they've inherited and retreats into them in times of danger. It's these kind of orthodoxies that cannot extend the boundaries to allow new thoughts and possibilities outside of what is inherited. It's these kind of orthodoxies that cannot extend boundaries to include even those who share values but from different perspectives. And therefore, that conversation between Helen Sussman and Nelson Mandela overcomes the inertia that can be brought about by those kind of conservative orthodoxies. But more importantly, this conversation also transcends and gives the lie to those who, find, who find themselves in the grip of the nihilism, the destructiveness of fundamentalism. Because a conversation like that would not take place under fundamentalist ideologies. Because fundamentalism can only label because it cannot debate. It can only condemn because it cannot embrace. It is only driven to anger because it has lost the capacity for compassion. It only knows how to kill because it has forgotten the art of loving. It knows how to die for a cause because it has forgotten how to live for a cause. And therefore, in the cauldron of apartheid of Africa, we find this great conversation of the middle ground beginning to emerge as a powerful antidote to fundamentalist discourses and a powerful new vista that it presents to orthodoxies. <coughs> that it understands justice as a critical injunction, as Rabbi Warren Goldstein said in the eulogy to Helen Sussman, that she was, and I quote, the living embodiment of the injunction of Deuteronomy, justice, justice thou shalt pursue, unquote. But in its pursuit of justice, it does so with compassion to accommodate 
the many paths that would lead to that same justice. Our difficulty often comes when we also lay claim to exclusive paths to shared goals. It is the engagement of a middle ground that is not carried away by false certainties or ideologies of certitudes in an increasingly uncertain and insecure world. It is the conversation of those who believe sufficiently to have faith, but to carry sufficient doubt to be open to others. That's the conversation that you hear between a Nelson Mandela and a Helen Sussman. More than the symbolism of what was done. More than two personalities who chose different paths. It was two people who carried <laughs> enough certainty in order to believe in what they stand for, but enough doubt to be open to others. And that begins to say what capacities we have begun to lose in the world today. It is the conversation of those who are secure enough in their own belief and ideology so that they have the confidence to recognize truth and wisdom in the belief and ideologies of others. It is often those who are insecure in their own belief who need to shut the truth that may exist in the beliefs of others. Had Nelson Mandela been an orthodox or fundamentalist nationalist, he could not have embraced Helen Sussman as a member of parliament. And if Helen Sussman had been an orthodox or fundamentalist capitalist, she would not have been able to open a heart to communists and nationalists who found themselves as the victims of apartheid. What they could have done was at best to be tolerant and patronizing towards each other, to adorn each other with platitudes, but not engage each other. What they would have done at worst was to deny each other, to destroy each other, and to be violent towards each other. They would not have been able to engage. Both Martin Luther King and Yitzhak Rabin were not allowed to complete their work and to see the fruits of whatever work they've had because of the intervening of those who could not engage in the engagement of the middle ground. And that leaves me, out of all of these examples, to begin to ask the question, is the world really divided by ideology of capitalism, communism, socialism, nationalism, and so forth? Is the world really divided by religion, Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Jews, Buddhists, etc.? Is the world really divided by identity? Or is the world divided by the mindsets and conversations of the ultra-Orthodox, the fundamentalists, or those trying to occupy a middle ground? The orthodoxies within Islam, Judaism, Christianity, have by and large the same response, even if they compete against each other. They have by and large the same response to the tide of globalization that has hit. It's to retreat into the chapels, the mosques, and the synagogues. It's to reconfirm things which they've received without knowing how to answer the questions of the day. Fundamentalists have their own conversations. They try to destroy each other because they are so much like each other. <laughs> All they are seeking is the domination of one fundamentalism against another. But at the end of the day, they are manifestations of the same plague that engulfs the world as it is today. Our task, learning, from the three people that we mentioned today and the fourth one that I've mentioned, Martin Luther King, Yitzhak Rabin, Helen Sussman, and Nelson Mandela, 
is to use the deep well of wisdom that is contained within orthodoxy and to help provide orthodoxy with a creative force that is able to think our way out of the challenges that we have today. It's to neutralize and negate the nihilism, the destructiveness of that fundamentalism. And it is to build a great middle ground where ordinary people who share both certainties and insecurities, beliefs and doubts, can open themselves up and say, I don't have all the answers. How many of the answers do you have? It is to shift from our obsession with binaries, with polarized debates, to explore the massive common ground that exists between us, and to refuse to be slaves to particular paths in order for us to better achieve shared destinations. The world we live in today requires all of these resources from all of us. It requires of us to shift from competitive religions to cooperative religion. Because if the truth be told, we are all struggling to put our labels on an ever-diminishing pool of believers rather than extending the number of people who have a valid belief that is relevant to the world in which they find themselves. We need to liberate our common values from fixed ideologies and forms of worship without jettisoning forms of worship but from it distill the kernel of values that we can trade with each other and make the world this better place. We need a capacity for empathy to see both the frailty as well as the grandeur of the human being in each one of us. I was astounded that as I prepared for a speech I was going to make in the church, I found there in the first epistle of St. John, not exactly sure where it is, but it basically says, who lives in God lives in love and God in them. And it ends, this you must know, I have given you of my spirit. I was told that somewhere in the book of Isaiah, there may be a similar reference to God blowing His Spirit into your nostrils. And it struck a chord because one of the key verses of the Quran says, I have blown of my Spirit into you. And what Nelson Mandela and Helen Susman recognized in each other were not the superficial things of life. It was the fact that each one carried a part of the divine in them, part of the Spirit of God that had been placed in each one that constitutes the human soul. And so often, we are diverted by the hair types. We speak to the hair before we speak to the divine. We speak to the color before we speak to the divine. We speak to the religion before we speak to the divine. We speak to the ethnicity before we speak to the divine. And what we need to rescue is the divine in each one of us. That's the great lesson of Helen Susman. Thank you very much.